any of this information is useful and can be taught to the patient. You know, sometimes when we see this, this might be happening. Have you ever thought about that or, you know, how you want to work through that and then maybe give them some ideas of how to handle stressful situations or why, what is it that you keep, you know, why do you keep avoiding the doctor's office? What's, what's really going on? Um, I can give just a couple of case examples. One was a 15-year-old, first pregnancy, um, lived out in a trailer in Nuevo, how many of you have ever been to Nuevo County? Fremont, White Cloud, all right, good, okay. <laughs> so kind of visualize, it can either be the woods or it's a farm, all right, and she was set way back in a trailer and it was, it was an icky trailer, it was run down. It was really, it was bad. For those of you that do home visits, you know what I mean. <laughs> there was garbage everywhere, the dogs on the chain running around, it's like, oh man, okay, just <laughs> stay on that chain, you know. <laughs> and uh, mom didn't have any teeth, you know, rolling her own cigarettes, and that was the grandma, mom. And and we, the more we got talking, and it was just apparent that there had, it was, it came out that there had been abuse and sexual abuse and so forth and so on. And we started working through the survivor mom's companion and it was, I think her, her mom sat with us the majority of the time and she herself had been abused. And it was so good for the two of them to work through it. It was like they were doing it simultaneously, even though really only one was in the study per se, both worked through the information. And I think it was very helpful for that grandma to be able to process some of her long-term grief and it was pretty much the same family members that had done all the abuse so it was it was very powerful in that way and I see that young mom periodically still and she's a good mom she's doing well she's well attached to that baby and um, so that's a good a good thing um, another case I can think of is um, one she was older and by older I mean 29 ish and I think she had four or five kids by that time and she was extremely high risk, and Gerber Hospital is a, um, a no VBAC hospital. What's the proper term for that? <laughs> Cesarean only. Once you've had one, you continue to have cesareans. And she was high risk medically, just on the book, you know, the diabetic, toxemia, the whole nine yards. And she kept having these babies, and she was married, like I said, for, first time married, husband, solid, steady strong Christian, active in their church, just, you know, kind of, but it's like, why does, she, in my mind, why does she continue to put herself at risk? Why, not only herself, but the unborn child and the other kids she has, and it, it had come out that she had been abused, so we started the Survivor Moms, and um, about halfway through, I'm trying to remember what module it was, but she put up the wall, and she would only let Kelly, the nurse, go back in. And finally, a few months later, though, she, she acquiesced and she allowed me to come back in. And it came out that prior to meeting her, prior to moving to Michigan, she had a, a life out on the East Coast and she had had three abortions. And she had never told anyone. And it, in her mind, God had called her to now have children and she was going to keep having as many children as she could until God said no more. And I just kept thinking, but you're high risk, you know? <laughs> so, but it just helping her work through some of that and trying to get her some counseling um, services, which kind of leads me to the next point here, the clinical setting in New Iowa County, it is tough going. Um, we have community mental health. There are a few private providers, but there again, not all of them take Medicaid. Um, I know Pine Rest is in Muskegon now and they, I believe someone spoke this morning from Pine Rest. And, oh, yay, okay. <laughs> so that is fantastic, but transportation is a huge barrier. And for people to come from Nuevo County down to Muskegon, why don't you come up to Fremont? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One day a week. No. <laughs> um, so anyways, it, it's tough. It's hard, hard to find the, the resources that we need. And lastly, the integrated care, which is the position I have now. Gerber Hospital no longer has the maternal infant health, um, so I transitioned over to New York County Community Mental Health and um, began working last June in the doctor's office across the street. And there are different types of integrated care models. There's a co-located, which is what I am. I am in a doctor's office and right in the mix. I mean, we're they kind of they call it the bullpen. It's where all the docs and the PAs and the MAs and the nurses hang out, and then their <laughs> offices are around that. And um, 
a doc or PA will just, somebody will come in depending on what the story, you know, I'm here for a sore throat or look at my toe or whatever. Um, but then they, they often pick up on other things and it's estimated that 40 to 70% of all primary care visits are not medical. They're emotionally related. So we're, I feel like we're, we are making a difference. We are being, I mean, literally, we are across the street from family health care to community mental health. And yes, there was communication back and forth before, but it was difficult. It, it never went smoothly. In fact, yesterday I was there at family health care and an MA came to me and she said, Rhonda, we've been trying to fax this. It was a referral for a speech therapy for a, for a toddler. And she said, we've been trying to fax this to CMH so the worker can take it wherever it needs to go. And she said, we've been trying all day. And I looked at her and I said, Tiffany, I said, I can walk it across the street this afternoon. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's kind of like, wow. And uh, so that's just one tiny example of working together and how we can improve the system. Take the information Julia has presented today, figure out how you can utilize it if you're home-based, if you're in a clinical setting, or you're doing more of the integrated care model. Uh, what can you do with it? What, what piece of that can you apply and make the world a better place for the, the pregnant moms we work with and uh, the babies that are going to be coming into this world? Is there a question back there? Yeah, well, yes. And um, we work actually with uh, youth 5 to 17 in um, wraparound program. Oh, yeah. And so in Kent County, I think we're in the third year of a six-year grant to implement the systems of care perspective. And so moving from that silo uh, model to now working with child welfare, mental health, juvenile justice, and then educational services. And, um, you know, I talk sometimes to my supervisor about the frustration of seeing these cycles and seeing the struggles our families deal with and that it does seem to happen on a cyclical, you know, in a cyclical way. And so hearing this just really excites me and kind of talking back here about how if this really got off the ground and was really widely implemented, how our jobs would change and how that would look different 10, 15 years from now mm -hmm. with the kids we're working with who are now being exposed to violence or foster care, um, child maltreatment, and so it just, I love the fact that we're looking at it earlier, we're looking at it when it can really make a long-term impact, it feels like. So I am excited, and I'm going to stick with my job, maybe, but I am <laughs> tempted to like come over to your side and work with, with first-time moms, and I just love it. It's exciting, so I'm glad we came. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming too. One of the things I really want to say, sort of two things. Um, a lot of federal programs right now are going toward being trauma informed. You know, SAMHSA, HRSA, that is their buzzword right now. They're trying to figure out how to make that so. We've been wanting to be trauma informed for like about a decade now. So we're moving on to the next thing because we don't want to be behind the government, we want to be ahead of the government. And we're really talking about being trauma explicit. Because trauma-informed is when the providers know it's a factor and sometimes they're able to plant seeds or talk about it. Trauma-explicit is when you have clients or you have services where you should be able to name it and deal with it overtly. And of course, it's really important to have the skills to know when is the client ready to do that and when are they not. That's why that one slide, are they far along? Are they still not safe? <coughs> or are they not ready to know? Being able to, if they're not ready to know, then you need to just do trauma-informed work. But if they are far along, if they can use the vocabulary and stay engaged, um, then trauma-explicit work is gonna push things even farther because it's gonna be like that grandmother and that daughter who now are allies together to protect that baby from the dangerous people in the extended family. And when you have <coughs> allies and when you can talk about it, you're gonna be able to stop the cycle um, in a way that's just much more efficient than when you sort of have to be on the lookout, you know? So confronting it and being trauma explicit, to my mind, is really the next frontier. Um, my email is on there, so if, if you would like any of those papers, I can send them to you as an email.